Uh, without further ado, I am uh, calling uh, a master, a, a mentor to me, uh, a true teacher of competition law, uh, someone who has been teaching competition law since December 1997, uh, just a month after the incorporation of the Turkish Competition Authority, someone uh, I had the privilege of working with on extremely significant cases while I was uh, an attorney in Brussels. Um, um, Ian Forrester um, is not only uh, one of the top attorneys of uh, competition law uh, in Europe, but he's also uh, a, a thinker of competition law and a teacher of competition law. So we have heard from uh, one of the top academicians, we've heard from one of the top executive uh, 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 in-house legal counsels, and now it's time for us to hear from uh, a top attorney on pharmaceutical patent litigations, are settlements anti-competitive bribes or pro-competitive common sense? Without further ado, uh, Ian Forrester, please. Thank you. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I first came to this lovely city when I was a student in my flower power days in, I think, 1969, and we crossed the Bosphorus in a bus because there was no, uh, there was no bridge. And um, then subsequently, upgrading the accommodations a little bit, in the 1990s, I stayed in this very hotel as the guest of the Turkish football authorities during the dramas about uh, Bosman and player transfers. And that made a completely different and more luxurious impression than the first one. Um, and now, 20 and a bit years later, to be the guest of uh, my dear friend uh, Gönenç, uh, it's uh, a lovely continuation of the phenomenon that Turkey is always surprising, always energetic, and always immensely hospitable. Now, I think that the, um, the organizers are to be commended because they have, as Gönenç just said, uh, produced three speakers. First of all, we had Richard Wish. Now, he is trained and has the extraordinary intellectual capacity to make things look the same, even though you know they're different. <laughs> um, and during the Middle Ages, there were glossators who worked on Roman law, and they took the Corpus Juris of Justinian and they, they knew that if there were discrepancies, it was because of the inadequacy of the scribes. And if you really worked hard enough, then you could make everything rational. There were no contradictions. But, um, well, we'll hold the but for the moment. And then we hear from Carly on the subject uh, of compliance. And he is a master. Beautiful talk. Fascinating description. Very articulate, very precise very concrete. It's easy to say, oh, be compliant, uh, but he has uh, tricks, tips, suggestions about how to make it work because it's boring. It's a waste of time. I don't need to do this. Why are you taking me away from my business? And he can make the notion of compliance attractive and uh, pro-business, and that's a phenomenal achievement. Now, this practitioner suggests that there is a problem at the moment with European competition law. And the problem is that the law is not adequately predictable and that the law from time to time is just daft, to use a Scottish word. It's crazy, it's irrational, and it's undesirable. And I'm going to um, I offered Gönnenc a menu of Forestarian protests about the law in certain areas, and uh, it's, it's a, a moderately luxurious menu, and he picked one of the dishes, uh, which is the settlement of pharmaceutical patents. And in the, uh, in the interests of full disclosure, I have to tell you, I confess, I'm a practicing lawyer, I give advice, it costs money, um, and I tend sometimes to agree with my clients' legal points of view. And even worse, even worse, uh, I have acted in the case of Servier, 
uh, who was, which was condemned last year and fined uh, 300 and something million euros, which for a Scot seems a lot of money, for the dreadful, dreadful crime of not litigating to the death a number of uh, disputes about whether its patents were valid and infringed. So, um, I will begin by describing the industrial policy context, because if you, if you understand the context, it may indicate, probably does in this case, does indicate the way in which the new legal initiative uh, is flowing, what drives it. We're talking pharmaceuticals. And if you talk pharmaceuticals, you talk patents. And if you talk patents, you're talking uh, intellectual property, IP. And if you're talking IP, you're talking passion, hysteria, exaggeration, frothing at the mouth, and gross excitement uh, about any limitation on the right of the IP holder. That's to say, um, I disagree with the proposition that IP rights are sacred and are immune from the competition rules, and I think that often we exaggerate in discussion the gravity of the, acu of, 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 the, of the threat. On the other hand, it's also the fact that when a competition agency and an I and a, uh, finds itself in the course of an examination of an investigation with a choice between competition and IP, generally speaking, competition policy prevails. So no one disagrees that um, patents are crucial. No one disagrees that pharmaceutical com companies have a unique, very special at least, uh, way of earning their living, which is finding a successful drug, uh, which during a quite short period of time finances future R&D and discovery activities. That's not disagreed. However, the problem is this. The patent on the molecule discovered by the innovator and brought to the market, say, 12 years later, 14 years later, um, describes the molecule. Once the molecule patent expires, there is no longer any patent protection and the prices go down. Uh, anyone, any generic company can imitate it and uh, the, 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 the monopoly of the innovator comes to an end. Pharma companies frequently seek to patent techniques by which the molecule is produced, and such was the case with Servier. Sometimes these techniques are very sophisticated, sometimes they're fairly basic, but in any event, they must satisfy the criteria for patentability in the European Patent Office in Munich. So far, so clear. Now, the industrial policy concern, as I characterize it, is this. Pharma companies are getting a bit greedy. They are asking for too much, too long, too generous protection. And by the use of process patents, they prolong the life beyond the 20, 23 years of the original patent uh, to maybe 25 or 27 years, and that's not fair. Whether you think it's fair or not, the public interest has uh, a proper concern about the possibility that instead of challenging a weak process patent, the generic potential competitor might be bought off, might be bribed, my word, by the pharma innovator. Okay. Now, um, these concerns are particularly, where have been particularly acute in the United States, where US legislation about um, the entry of new, um, uh, of new offerors of, of um, 
patented medicines where the patents are soon to expire, um, the US legislation is tricky, complicated, and creates some perverse incentives for conduct which seems um, objectively to be strange. Now, the US legislation has been criticized by the FTC, and the FTC has for years argued before district courts and circuit courts that deals between the pharma innovator and generic would-be new entrants were anti-competitive. And uh, roughly 73, the, F the FTC has lost. That's to say, the pharma innovators generally prevailed when there were antitrust uh, challenges to the validity of a deal between the innovator and the, um, and the generic entrant, or would-be entrant. The US Supreme Court, uh, 15 months ago, uh, gave judgment in a case called Activists. And it was confronted with two, you might say, extreme positions. One was the innovator companies saying, this is an IP right, uh, and now I'm exaggerating. Sometimes I do, but this is health warning. Uh, the IP companies were saying, uh, the, the, the pharma companies were saying, the IP right immunizes us, in effect, from the US antitrust law. This is a deal which is incapable of being examined without considering the strength of the underlying patent. Because if we have a valid patent, any deal that we do uh, can't limit uh, the, uh, the anti-competitive nature of the monopoly right that the patent gives us. Therefore, these cases just, it's no point in looking at them. That was one extreme viewpoint. The other extreme viewpoint uh, was of the FTC that said this is intrinsically bad. This is a deal where uh, the uh, generic uh, would-be entrant is given a bribe to leave the field, to abandon uh, for a period of time uh, entry into the market and that's intrinsically anti-competitive. So you don't need to, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a per se, it's, it's an obvious infringement. Supreme Court in activists uh, took neither point of view and took a middle way saying uh, we should look at all the circumstances. Okay, so that debate in the United States put on the agenda of competition authorities around the world, the question of the desirability and the legitimacy of r settlement agreements between pharma companies and uh, generic companies. And in the course of uh, about eight, nine years ago, uh, the course of the 2000s, uh, an elaborate investigation was mounted and we are now seeing uh, some fruit of that investigation, and I suggest that the fruit are bad fruit. There is a, so that's the overall political institutional context. Let's look more precisely at the nature of the debate, of the dispute. So, um, the pharma company has got a very successful molecule which has been the basis of, to its ple pleasure and surprise, um, uh, a big, big sales. It has achieved success with doctors. And uh, the patent um, is moving towards its 20 or 22 or 23 years of life to the end of that period. There will be generic offerors who want to enter the market as soon as possible with a product. Now, question, will the generic product infringe or not the uh, pharma company's product? And is that patent on the product valid? Is that patent on the process valid? So these controversies arise all the time. And there is a structural necessity 
for litigation in the sense that the pharma, the two sides of the debate, need to know authoritatively whether the patent's valid and whether the patent's infringed. Now, a consequence of that is that a few years ago at least, many litigations were started uh, concerning the validity or the infringement or both of the patent. Now, where were they started? At the moment, we have 29 jurisdictions in the European Union. Uh, the 29th is Scotland, which has a separate legal system. So if you want to indulge your patent lawyers around Europe, you would have to unleash 29 separate litigations. Grotesque. If you litigate in London, you may discover that the English judge reaches a different conclusion than the German judge and the French judge, each looking at the same innovation. Therefore, winning in one place doesn't mean you're going to win in another place. That is one of the vices of the uh, IP litigation system which Europe is saddled with and following treaty negotiations is maybe going to move away from. But for the moment, we're stuck with 28 plus 1 possible jurisdictions in which a patent dispute could be litigated. Now, in those circumstances, it's obvious that there is an interest on the part of uh, both sides in considering a settlement. Must be so. One can't litigate everything. Uh, that's true of a dispute with your builder, a dispute with your doctor, a dispute with your neighbour, a dispute with the government. Not every litigation that started can be continued to an end. And so the question is, is there something specially undesirable about litigations being settled relating to pharmaceuticals? Yes, says the public authority, pharmaceuticals are paid for, generally speaking, in Europe by the state. And therefore, there is a public interest in the judicial challenge, uh, in the judicial determination of the validity or not of a patent. And as a consequence, when the two sides reach a settlement in which one side decides to abandon and, the, and uh, the other side continues, there is therefore a diminution of the chance that a court would look at this patent and conclude that it was invalid. Now, the objection appears to be true both for strong and for weak patents. Strange, but so. Now, I haven't yet mentioned an important element in the theory by which patent uh, settlements are invalid, and that's the notion of the value transfer. So the bribe, supposedly, my word, is this. The pharma company, the innovator, and the generic company, the infringer, have a discussion, and the pharma company says, if we can settle now, we'll appoint you our distributor for this other product, or we'll give you a license of this other product, or they do a deal on something. Now that, as you know from private practice, is very common. The two companies are having a fight. They're told we might win, we're not sure. The expert's a bit wobbly, don't like that judge, but no, we'll probably win, but I'm not sure. Well, we might win. Um, now that discussion goes on every time a litigation is under discussion. So what do you, can we settle? Yes, what are you going to pay me? Oh, I don't owe you anything. No, 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 you, uh, uh. Um, The discussion is perfectly routine. And the deal is, all right, if we do a deal on this, uh, we'll enter a deal on that. Now, um, I'll give you a little example. Uh, this is, yeah, I'll give you a little example. A company has decided that um, the, patent, the patentees, the innovator's patent, 
was invalid. And so it says to itself, the generic company, I can come to the market and sell in infringement of this patent because my experts tell me it's invalid. Litigation starts and the company, the generic company, loses. And it says, geez, we need to switch our lawyers. Oh dear, how did we get this so wrong? What can we do? And uh, they're told, oh, well, this is, this is very difficult. We'll need to develop a new technique to make this uh, product in a non-infringing matter, in a non-infringing manner. How long will that take? A couple of years? Okay, for the next couple of years, we need a license because otherwise we are infringing this patent in half a dozen different countries. And so the loser goes to the winner and says, will you give me a license? Yes, we'll give you a license, you pay, good, they sign up. And of course, you're going to drop this litigation. Yes, they abandon the litigation. Um, that is a gross, finable infringement, uh, justifying the imposition of a heavy fine on both companies. That seems to me perfectly absurd. Second possibility, the company, the generic company, is told by a public authority in Europe, um, sorry, but the generic medicine you're going to sell has got impurities, so you can't sell it. We're not going to give you a marketing authorization. And uh, there's discussion, and they realize they're infringing, and even if they were to win and prove they weren't infringing, they don't have a product to put on the market. And they say, okay, let's do a settlement. And they negotiate a settlement. And that also is a finable infringement. So I find that um, the theory of public concern is not an invalid one. That's to say there might be situations where the public interest is damaged by the phenomenon of uh, anti-competitive settlements. It's not impossible and the, there are previous cases which confirm that settlements as such do not enjoy immunity from the scrutiny of the competition rules. But what I find troublesome is the uh, attribution to such settlements of incurably anti-competitive features without regard to the overall context. Now, I've described to you the theories uh, of the infringement, and let me now explain the new notion as to dominance. Dominance, as you know, is a much bigger weapon with which uh, very heavy and heavier fines can be justified. In the case of perindopril, perindopril, the Servier product, was the um, one of the family of ACE inhibitors. It was not the first, it was not the third, it was not the tenth, it was the fifteenth ACE inhibitor to come to the market. It was never the first medicine in any country. It had one or two percent of the market in several member states and it had a bit over 20 percent uh, in France. It was deemed to be dominant on the basis that doctors give repeat prescriptions. That's to say, um, because a medicine is likely to be repeated in repeat prescriptions to the patient, that unfortunate or fortunate manufacturer is to be deemed in a dominant position. And therefore, when the manufacturer does a deal with the generic company, that is uh, a violation uh, of the new crime of inducement, having money and doing a deal with a generic company which is anti-competitive. So, um, we're not going to be hearing, though I don't really believe it, from Gurnetsch, but that's no justification for me to talk too long. Let me offer a few closing summaries of elements to worry about in what I have been saying. Um, 
One is that very commonly when IP and competition law come in, co in, in contestation, generally it's the IP right which loses and I think competition agencies are insufficiently respectful outside the United States of the uh, pro-competitive merit of intellectual property um, uh, protection. Um, second, uh, much of the condemnation turns on intention and email indications uh, which, as Carly will tell you, are found very commonly in many, in many companies. In other words, it's difficult for a dominant company, supposedly, to, or a successful one, not to compete and to be pleased about business success. Um, the friendly rivalry between the United States and Europe mean that today it is more fun for an official to make new law creatively in Brussels than it is, and he has a better chance, or she has a better chance of judicial success, uh, than would be the case in the United States, where each administrative act is subject to the skeptical scrutiny uh, of uh, judges who owe no deference uh, to the public authority. So, um, we are here to hear, well, to honor the birthday of this promising and very successful, more than promising, uh, legal practice. We're here because we have an interest in competition law as a discipline. Our first two speakers made sense of it very brilliantly. This speaker suggests that intellectual quality and consistency are for a variety of reasons not as good in Brussels as they should be. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, uh, illuminating uh, presentation, Ian. Um, the reverse pharma patent settlements have always been a, an, an issue of antitrust enforcement. Um, Ian and I were speaking about this at the Informa uh, conference in Brussels uh, a year ago. We were on the same panel. Um, and there, there was a hot debate as to whether this should be a per se uh, illegal category, as there still is today. And I think it's very fruitful and helpful to contrast some of the debate here with what Richard said in the morning. Whenever I'm reading the type of decisions that the uh, carte bancaire decision uh, go into, or the discussions that the carte bancaire decision has gone into, I always feel that the, uh, the um, single-handed per se like treatments area should shrink uh, and these kinds of decisions are also a testament uh, to that. Uh, the Turkish Competition Authority has come up uh, relatively recently uh, with a very significant pharma sectoral inquiry report. Uh, a, a huge uh, effort and energy has gone into it not only at the side of the Turkish Competition Authority but I must say uh, having represented pharma companies in that vein um, the pharma companies were swamped in a lot of homework and, and uh, data collection as well. So um, I think it would be uh, interesting to see how this, how this develops. Uh, just last year uh, in Istanbul Bilgi University at the brilliant program of Kerem Cem Sanlı who is, who is here today, um, I, I had also delivered a speech on uh, patent settlements uh, in antitrust law and uh, um, it's not a candidate to being uh, an Im immediately hot topic in Turkey uh, because of the situation of patents uh, uh, of uh, pharma products in Turkey. But still, I think we can learn quite a lot from this debate that is happening uh, outside of Turkey. 